On this week's edition of Carpe Diem, we will take a look at three different outreach programs you may not have expected to see across the state of New Jersey. Thank you for joining us for this special edition of Carpe Diem. I'm Caitlin Schoffel. The program you're about to watch is part of a special series of Carpe Diem episodes produced by the students of the Television Digital Media major at Montclair State University. Our production team, Networking Fingers, is responsible for today's half hour program. From the soccer fields to the streets, soccer freestyling is an up and coming sport that soon everyone will be talking about. I met with two members of the New York Red Bull street team to get the inside scoop of what soccer freestyling is all about. Yeah. 
glance, soccer freestyling may not seem like a youth outreach tool. However, these two freestylers have shown how the sport can be used to both get kids active and teach valuable lessons such as anti-bullying. Teachers at Elizabeth High School continue to encourage kids to join extracurricular activities to keep them on the right path. Stephanie Gore met with the advisors of EHS's forensics team to talk about how they are helping students through public speaking and debate. Forensics is our competitive acting speech and debate team. Uh, forensics often gets confused for other things. So speech and debate, I should explain, is um, just an area of academic extracurricular activity where the kids are able to focus on their public speaking skills and presentation um, and in the debate side, I guess, just how to form arguments and 
uh, argue critically. And then they prepare different, different categories in which they're allowed to compete both at a local and national level. The kids are pulling from published resources, so anything that has an ISBN number or has been published in, in, in physical form and the challenge is put on them to go look for material, now they're forced to explore the world of literature, the world of, of uh, theater or classical films or you know just cultural pop culture in general. You cut it down to 10 minutes and then from there it, you memorize which is sometimes a big challenge for our kids. You memorize and then after memorization is when you start to work on the character development and you make the piece come to life. And so the reason that there's a 10 minute limitation is because again the challenges that come from that. A student can take an hour-long piece and I guess memorize it and put performance um, put a performance on for a group but a, logistically it won't make sense to have 30 kids doing an hour performance, and B, they're not really doing much with it. They're just doing what they're told. Please, leader, tell us again the story about the captain. Oh, yeah, uh, tell us, leader. All right, everybody, settle down, settle down. But first, you two have to promise that to... And the student is challenged to, first of all, understand the, the elements of a story, a beginning, a middle, an end, uh, the rise and fall of a conflict, character development, all of that has to come into consideration. What our captain, Captain Crunch, our savior of saviors. You're going to be focusing on the essentials. Do you have good presence? Are you using great poise, enunciation, articulation? Have you memorized? Uh, can I hear you? Are you projecting well? Are you using your hands in a way that is efficient? Is your body language matching your, your tone? So all the nitty-gritty aspects of a public performance or what a public speaking class would focus on. No way! It can't be! There are performance aspects of public speaking. They can uh, allow to either explore these forms of literature in a humorous way, which would be humorous interpretation, in a dramatic, more emotional, more serious way, which would be dramatic interpretation, declamation speech, extemporary speech. Original oratory, impromptu speaking, improvisational acting, prose reading, poetry reading, uh, and then we go into debate where we have Lincoln-Douglas debate, public forum debate, and um, some schools work with policy debate. The most complicated and the most technical category is duo interpretation because there's two students working together and the catch is they can't look at each other and they pass off things to one another but they can never look at one another so they're passing forward and the other, other person must have it timed correctly so that they're receiving whatever's being passed to them and they'll be able to move around one another and maneuver the whole situation without looking at each other. And that's actually a category that me and Elizabeth we also specialize in. And it's amazing to see how two students are able to portray as many characters as they need to, but it's so flawless that you don't even notice that that they're they're you don't even notice that they're not looking at each other. We have an intruder at the playground. And the kids, you know, they're not allowed to use props. They have to pantomime everything. So their pantomime skills are so crisp and so clean that sometimes when, when they're chewing gum or holding a baby, you really see those things. They're, they're, they're so defined and so focused on their, their ability to create something out of nothing. Of course you do. Her older cousin, Magdalena, told her about it when she was six. You might not have been there. Of course they don't know Magdalena. They weren't there. Hmm. Maybe they should meet her. <sighs> Hola, I'm Marta. With public speaking in general, the, the skill is important because it holds students accountable for their voice and their expression. Forensics is, is, um, is a skill, and forensics is something that follows the kids for the rest of their lives. The kids coming from an urban district off obviously have those struggles of um, having to compete with other distractions in order to just focus academically um, in their own lives. So with forensics and public speaking and debate, what it does is it offers them this opportunity to explore these various avenues of discourse.
We go to about 10 to 15 local tournaments the, in New Jersey. A typical tournament will take up an entire day, at least from 9 a.m. to about 7 p.m. The competition is broken into three rounds where students are compete inside classrooms. After preliminary rounds, you know, tabulations are going on to score uh, who is doing the best amongst the 30 kids, say, in a category of poetry. Broken poetry. The top six of those 30 will advance to a final round where they'll hit each other in a room and from those six we get our first through six placements. We have a beautiful team and the kids are family members. They support each other in every way. The most heartwarming thing is to see on the bus ride home of food, a new kid you know, didn't do as well as they wanted to at a tournament is to watch a veteran member come over and support them and motivate them and inspire them to take that, take what they did that day and turn it around and make it something, make it better for the next time. The Elizabeth team and in the state of New Jersey they've always had this kind of reputation for just embracing this. We are an urban school so we are diverse and we embrace our diversity so we try to encourage that. We tend to compete against more suburban, more affluent neighborhoods, so we kind of stick out like a sore thumb. So the kids learn to embrace that and use that for their benefit. And what happens is the students develop a sense of pride for their city. Having gone through this team, and the same thing I think Ms. Drummond would say, is we just want to be able to contribute that much more to our team. There's a sense of loyalty there. And it's funny because the loyalty for me, I would say, is to the team. You know, there might be 90 kids one day, there might be 50, there might be 10. It doesn't really matter to me. It's a matter of, okay, so what are we going to do with the team, the name of itself, the legacy of Elizabeth? How is it going to progress from there? Uh, because it has come a long way and it's always kind of been this underdog story for Elizabeth. And the underdog story has sometimes ended in a way that is completely satisfying and sometimes it's come short so we always want to try to make it better every year. My goal as the coach of the forensics team is to provide students with fun, safe and educational opportunity to make them realize that this after school club, this, this team that we've created is something that's going to stay with them forever and something these skills that they're learning here are skills that are going to translate into their careers, into their social lives, into their families, into everything they do. Elizabeth High School has come a long way over the years, subdividing the school into academies and becoming a blue ribbon urban school. Now we will be taking a short break but when we come back, we will be highlighting an outreach program celebrating 125 years of service. When Logan was first born, um, we didn't really know what to expect. Logan was extremely small and went through a lot of different um, obstacles in his journey through the, uh, the NICU. I always tell people that they told us that he the likelihood of him getting something was one in a million, and it just seemed like Logan was always that one in a million. But he always came through fighting. Um, it's through our experience with the neonatal intensive care unit, though, that we decided to get involved and give back. And uh, the March of Dimes was the great uh, was a great avenue for us to do so. He's a first grader at Atlanta County Special Services. Um, and he's thriving. He does have cerebral palsy, but that's not stopped him from doing anything. He really is a great young boy that's inspired so many. He's a little boy that with a smile I, I think could end some world wars because he's just, he's just happy. Newark Public Library is a valued institution that will be celebrating 125 years of service and outreach. This spring, the library will be hosting an exhibit showcasing the library's rich history. Jen Kanad talks with employees and trustees of the library.
These are challenging times, but that makes them exciting times. Uh, we are still in a, uh, in a society where as many as two-thirds of fourth graders aren't reading at a grade level. For children, we provide, uh, I'd like to think, um, a good foundation for literacy and love of reading. Uh, we provide story hours on a regular basis, um, educational programming, and a lot of leisure, what could be considered leisure activities like games, etc. but they're um, building skills for children, so we do quite a lot of that. Well, it probably is the most important public institution that was started in Newark uh, in the early years of the last century. Important for two reasons. Newark at the time was a very gritty immigrant city, a lot of first generation immigrants from southern and eastern Europe, a lot of recent migrants from the American South. And the city was growing, but it was growing without a navigational tool. And perhaps the most important navigational tool at that time was the library. In 1889, a building was opened on West Park Street. When that building opened, they took all of the association's holdings and they opened up with 10,000 volumes of materials. That library was open for about 10 years, slightly more. Newark continued to grow. The space was small, so they couldn't really meet demand. It became too crowded. So the trustees started looking for other options and about 1889 they put out a competition for a design for a new building so they purchased the land here and an architectural firm of Rankin and Kellogg from Philadelphia they won the bid they were known for their Beaux-Arts style and it was a four-story design based on the 15th century Palazzo Strozzi in Florence and it was a massive building because it would contain galleries and auditorium and also the museum. Back in the day, the library and the museum were together. Uh, on the interior of the building, when visitors walked in when the library was open, there was a massive marble staircase right in the center. And various types of marble were used throughout the space, on the columns and the stairs and the floors and the panels. And on the ceiling, there were mosaics. You can't miss it, there's a large mural that was completed in 1927 by classical realist painter Robert Hale Ives Gamel. And that is titled The Fountain of Knowledge and that shows muses carrying knowledge to the corners of the world. And in the lower left-hand corner, you can see a likeness of John Cotton Dana, who was a library's second director. But there are just so many beautiful elements of the building, we certainly encourage visitors to come and look at it themselves. Budget cuts have really impacted us. Not only do we have fewer staff working here, I would say we've had um, maybe a 30 or 40 percent reduction in staff over the last eight years. Um, we've also had to, very sadly, close three of our branches and, you know, very active branches, by the way. So we hope that we can turn it around eventually, but it has impacted us. Well, the budget cuts that we faced over the last five years were a real challenge. Um, we had to really focus our operations, uh, stop doing things that were uh, no, no longer so important, and uh, really um, uh, make the best possible use of the funds that we did have. But that's always been the case for libraries. Uh, there's never enough money. Um, but the city of Newark uh, has been supportive. Uh, we understand how important it was for the city to really come to terms with its structural deficit and bring that into order. Uh, that's mostly been done and we're optimistic for the future. Um, and we, just the whole challenge of how we best use our, sp use our staff, how we best use the buildings that we have, uh, and how best we can uh, really serve the people of Newark. It's a bracing task, but it's an exciting task, and we wouldn't want it any other way. It'll be called the Newark Public Library, 125 years of innovation and service, 
and we're basing the year off of 1889 because that's when the first library building opened at the other location. And it's gonna open the third week of April during National Library Week, and it'll run through the end of August. Basically, it's gonna be arranged by theme. The beginning will start off chronologically, the beginning of the library, more into John Cotton Dana, and then we'll focus on different areas, such as library outreach, divisions, different programs, children's services, branches, and art, and some others. The 125th anniversary is really something that we're very, very proud of. I mean, there are not many organizations or institutions that have been able to last that long and to continue to provide really um, good services. And we hope to continue another 125 years. I'm very excited about the exhibit that's coming up. And the Newark Public Library for many years has been almost a living room for the people of Newark where you can hear news about newly published books, old books, art, citizenship, changes in the city. So this is like the people's, it's obviously the people's library, but it might also be the people's, uh, the people's um, university, the people's college. Well, the uh, library has been a gathering place. It's been uh, a constant encouragement to individuals uh, for their lifelong education for their self-education. People come with their own issues, their own concerns, and they choose how to use us. That's, that's rarely the case, or I can't think of another institution for which that's the case. Here, you can see anything in our collections. You can go to any librarian, any reference librarian, ask a question, and we'll help you find the answer. And that engagement with the community in, um, in continuing effective ways is really how it's helped generations of new Newarkers make their way, uh, support their families, and, and uh, build their future. This library holds such an abundant treasure is what makes me such an enthusiastic supporter. But the final reason is just because libraries provide, in many different branches in our communities, really do provide, again, places for our community to connect to information, to opportunities, places that are safe and quiet to study, to reflect, to imagine, to dream. And that's why they're such a critically important institution for the city, for the state, and for our nation. Please stop by the exhibit to check out the library's extensive history and show your support. For more information about exhibits and programs, visit www.npl.org. For more information about this edition or any other edition of Carpe Diem, you can contact us at 973-655-5158 or email us at carpediem at mail.montclair.edu. I'm Caitlin Schofel. Thanks for watching.